The glorified idea of a starving artist is a myth. There was a time in my life when I could have been considered a starving artist based on three things. One, starving artists sacrifice material wealth in order to do their art. Two, they live on minimal expenses because either the art is not just selling or deeper, they don't have the time or resources to be very good sellers themselves. And three, all of their disposable income goes into making more art. I fit the bill on all three counts. But like so many of my contemporaries and master artists and writers before us, I was choosing into this. Based on a study across 40 states with 13,000 participants, toiling to eat is not required. 92% of those artists worked in professional jobs that they actually enjoyed. And 57% were holding down two jobs, all while still doing their art. In my starving artist era, I was couch surfing most of the time, relying on the goodwill of family and friends for a place to lay my head. I knew all the best places in town to eat for cheap or free, and the best thrift stores to find a winter coat for $10. I was deeply entrenched in my own personal culture of, of spending little to nothing to survive. Nobody knew this was my life. Because I had prioritized writing poems over almost every other obligation, I had been making some amazing poetry and getting recognized for it. I was the most flagrant have not in the land of have nots. <laughs> as long as I could still write a poem. Somewhere inside of me, I had absorbed this belief in my marrow that <laughs> the most honorable artists are the ones who starve while they live, but create estates that make a fortune when they die. But there was a day when it all came into question. My 80-something-year-old grandmother said the thing that would rock me to my core. She said, we must have a curse on this family because we can't seem to hold on to any money. A curse? This was our matriarch, the rock that never cracked. And she had convinced herself that no matter what else was happening in the world, she had earned her place at the right hand of Jesus and her wings in the kingdom of heaven. So what was she saying to me in this moment about a curse? I had known my granny to walk with unshakable faith. So the utter worship of a curse in this moment was unfathomable to me. It not only hurt my feelings, but to think that I too was cursed, it totally disrupted the fabric of my soul. She was saying that I had a limit on who I could become or what I could have. She was saying that the entire notion of my own fate was out of my control. I was determined to prove her wrong. We were not cursed. We were continuously making bad decisions. <laughs> and I was afraid to look at my own financial decisions honestly. I knew where my peers were, and I was so far behind. I had a pivotal conversation with another poet friend of mine. Um, and I said to her <laughs> that I had not acquired anything. She had acquired a lot of material things. I said, it is really rocking me in my soul, in my ancestors' bones, to think that so much time has passed and I have not acquired anything to pass on to my children or anything I can physically touch as my own legacy. She assured me I would easily shift this narrative in no time at all. It's not that I hadn't acquired anything priceless, 
I had been in space and conversation with some of the most prominent literary luminaries of our time, breaking bread and making poems. And that's something she hadn't done. And it was something money couldn't buy. She was right, of course, but I still wanted to own something. First, I started to take a look at all the financial facts about myself I was comfortable ignoring. I had created some powerful poems, but I had not acquired anything material. No house, not even a bank account. Then I looked at a credit score that I believed was abysmal. To be honest, I hadn't even looked at the credit score in years, thinking that it was so horrible <laughs> that I would never be able to recover. I read everything I could get my hands on about the way credit is determined, even the little things you can do to increase a score, like making sure your name is the same and consistent across all three credit bureaus. Next, I worked on income. I knew that I had to change the way I made art if I also wanted to make money. So I set a goal with myself. Never again would I work for less than $100,000. I spoke this into the universe. I changed my chase. I decided I would say no to anything that didn't serve me. And I stayed on track with my income. Then it was time to buy something. And I wanted a house. No, I wanted a home. I asked my spouse to join me in this pursuit, asked him to pull his credit so we could make sure that we were both in a position to purchase. For two years, he ignored me, afraid in that same mental space where I had been sitting, that his credit was too horrible and wouldn't recover. It wasn't fight or flight with him. It was fright and effort. I didn't wait for him. From the time I was a little girl, I had learned the, the difference between houseless and homeless. I'd spent an extraordinary amount of time being houseless. I didn't own a house, the container that holds furniture and memories and rituals. I pulled a sketch of a house I had done 15 years earlier. That was the house of my dreams. It was shaped like an octagon. It had large picture windows that looked out over a luscious landscape. It was three stories. It had room for a long dining table where I would serve meals to the people that I loved, nooks where I could just sit and write. I had a realtor helping me to, to look for this house, which would be called Lucid. Lucid because every dream I could imagine for myself would be clear there. The realtor was taking his time. So as a go-getter, I started cruising neighborhoods <laughs> to try to find the house that I wanted. One day, I came to a house on a hill situated on an acre of land and there was an open house. I stepped into a sunken living room with large picture windows. It was three stories. I stood in the middle of that room and closed my eyes, and I saw my entire life unfolding in this space. I knew that I wanted to be in this house, but I didn't know that I could afford it. But the pull of it, the piece of it, the timing of it made me know that this house was mine. I did a little more research on the neighborhood and discovered there was a prominent black family, the Chins, who were an enslaved couple who took money and land given to them by their dying slave owner, and they built a community. And the house that I was connecting to so deeply, decidedly my house, was in the middle of that community. Somehow I felt like maybe I was here to carry on the legacy of the Chins. 
I knew why I was connecting so much to this place. A house is a physical thing that can hold all your material possessions. But a house also has a soul, which makes it a home. The soul of this house on a hill in Northern Virginia was already connected to me. I speak to my granny, now an ancestor from this house. We are not cursed, granny. We are lucid. All things are clear here. And the artist who owns this place still breaks bread, still makes poems, and is choosing never to starve. 